Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the fifth and final webinar in our Embracing New Ways of Working series. Today, I am most fortunate to be joined by three inspiring, smart ladies, each bringing a different perspective to one great big question, has coronavirus killed traditional modes of learning? I'd love to introduce these three minds. Uh, I'll start with Leanne Renninger, a doctor of neuroscience and also the founder and CEO of Life Labs Learning. I've invited Leanne because she and Life Labs Learning are, on an, are an organization I truly believe every people professional in the UK and frankly the world needs to know. Leanne will be discussing this topic from her experience of researching the skills research, uh, required for exceptional inclusive leadership behaviors and also building learning products that have helped people and continue to help people learn and hone those behaviors. Second is uh, the wonderful Professor Linda Grattan, uh, who is a thought leader in all things related to the future of work and more broadly, future of mankind. Linda will be bringing decades of research to the table, including uh, from her latest books, The Hundred Year Life and The New Long Life, which if you haven't read, I 100% recommend you do. And she'll be using all of this research to help us explore this on a more macro level. And finally, I am joined by uh, a former colleague and good friend of mine, Laura Pettit, who is a senior leader of L&D within the Lego Group, and she'll be looking at answering this question from the organisational and practical perspective. Hello, ladies. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> All, all at once, wonderful. Okay, <laughs> so, thank you. So um, these three ladies absolutely blew my mind last week in our run through to a point that uh, my mind is a blur with excitement just thinking about, but thinking back on that. I will actually leave a lot of the conversation to them in true panel format. I'll throw questions here and there, uh, nothing particularly structured as they're really, really good at looking after themselves. Uh, but I will be looking out for questions in the chat box from you as the audience. So if you do have questions, please don't be afraid to ask them and I'll weave those into the conversation um, and I know it will be a really fascinating discussion for everybody to get their teeth into. So thank you again for joining. Um, I'm going to start by asking Leanne uh, her macro view of this, this question. Leanne, has coronavirus killed traditional modes of learning? <laughs> Yes. Um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting us all. I, I just want to say, like, wherever it seems that Dean and the Avada crew is, there's like this wake of interesting <laughs> coming together afterwards. So I'm happy to be here and answering this question. Um, yeah. And so when I was thinking about this question, one of the, the thoughts for me was like figuring out, well, wait, what is like traditional modes of learning? And, um, and I was interested in particularly in the word learning. And my answer there would be, I don't think that we can uh, restructure the way the brain thinks. It's not new, it's not new, it's actually how we learn. And so just to briefly talk about that, because that will talk, then uh, reflect on what is new. Um, if we think about the fact that the brain is made up of neural networks, of synapses, and these synapses really need to come together to be able to make learning happen in that very moment. And um, the way that we're learning is through associations, and there's a lot of more things around that, like potentiation, where these neural networks get stronger and stronger. Um, and basically, we're trying to turn trace neurons into um, like long-term potentiated networks. Um, now, the thing there is that that's not new, right? And so we're going to have to work with the brain's architecture, like what we're all given underneath this hood. Um, but what is new is that we've got a whole bunch of new conditions for the brain to operate within. And uh, just to kind of sum up my answer there, I would say what's, what's really important is to recognize what's called allostatic load. So the brain is under new conditions where what's going to be happening is uh, we have ambiguity, uh, volatility, all these, these things called VUCA, uh, and the, the military term VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And with that, there's, there's a fog that starts happening, uh, like a smudge of our days where we actually can't demarcate what's actually going on. And that's going to really interfere with learning. And so I, I would have a lot more to share a little bit later uh, around that, but um, it means we're going to have to design, we're going to engineer learning to be quite different for ourselves and for others um, in order for that learning to actually stick. And I'll stop there to let the others weigh in if, if needed, but that's my, my, my biggest difference, I would say, is the environment. Leanne, could you just say that phrase, something load, what, what was the word? 
Yeah, it's allostatic load. Allostatic. Okay, interesting. So that, that's that's an almost like a fog sensation that we that we as human beings experience in this sort of crisis that we've been in. You got it. You got it. So basically, as soon as the brain shifts from having moments of acute stress to actually chronic, and and probably not, won't feel chronic, but it is chronic in that we really don't know one day to the other what's what's going on. There's some volatility in this. The brain picks up on that, and we, we actually start shifting the types of hormones that are getting released and the ability for the neurons to be able to, to create the synapses that we need. It's definitely ha there's interference built into there because the brain's focusing on other things. Wow, amazing. I, I, I just think of that on a macro level. If everybody is having that experience, what could that what could the impact of that, of that on our relationships be and, and our relationships with work and our relationships in society and those sorts of things? I'm wondering, Linda, if, 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 you've, if you've got a view of the societal impact of, of what Leanne's just outlined there. Yeah, well, you know, Leanne, thank you, Jean, and, and like Leanne, it's, it's a real pleasure to be talking uh, about this incredibly important topic. Uh, today. Um, so from the very beginning of COVID, actually, I've been keeping a diary. Day 137. Volume 3. Volume 3. <laughs> day 137. Uh, and one thing that became obvious really early on, because we've also, I've been running a series of webinars and, uh, and we have a survey, our own uh, Hotspots Movement survey, is just as Anna said, you know, that one of the first things that really surprised us is that when we were working at home, particularly those of us who are looking after young children, uh, the transitions that we normally go through, you know, so you know, in a normal day, you would uh, leave home with all the transitional objects that you have, you know, your, your, your computer, your bag, your, your clo you change your clothes, you go to work. And, and actually, you know, learning takes place because when you're at work, your brain is already relaxed and ready. And so generally, pre-COVID, we only <coughs> really had two transitions, you know, one from work to home and the other from home to work. We've been looking at the number of transitions people have gone through, and for many of us, it's 16 or 17 a day. And so each time we make a transition, it's more difficult for us to sort of get back to where we are, concentrating on what we were trying to do, as we also think about, you know, doing the washing, looking after the children, blah, 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 blah. So that's the first thing that we really noticed, Dean, in terms of uh, learning and, and what's happening now. But the second thing, which I think is potentially sort of really exciting, is that we did, we are learning how to, how to learn with technology. And, and I'm a professor at the London Business School. So obviously, um, we've now gone completely hybrid. So we are now running programs, or expect to be running in programs in September. We have Zoomers and Roomers. We have Roomers who are in the room, uh, students who are in the room, and Zoomers who are out of the room. We actually have a bigger MBA class this year than we've ever had in the whole history of London Business School. So we've got a lot of students who want to engage with us, but actually, you know, the process is much more difficult. And, and I think from that has come an amazing experiment. So, for example, my own uh, advisory group, HSM, uh, only last week, ran uh, one of its learning platforms with um, more than 250,000 people from one company, uh, hack, you know, hacking an issue about the future that they wanted to sort out. And, you know, that's just an extraordinary experiment. And I think that we're seeing more and more people wanting to use the technology that we have available to us uh, to really change the way that we learn and change the way that we work. So that, for me, as somebody who's been talking for decades about the future of work, I'm finding that just incredibly exciting. Amazing. 250,000 people. What, what, what sort of things were they looking at solving? Well, um, I can't tell you that, actually, because that one was a really confidential one. But we ran the one a week before on, um, on what, how, how can we work post-COVID. So what, what, you know, what we found from our surveys, and you, you'll know this yourself, is only about 6% of people say, I really want to get back to where I was in terms of how I work. So one of the questions that people are asking on these big platforms is, you know, how do you want to work? And, and, and you know, I've made the analogy of uh, unfreeze, refreeze. Uh, uh, you know, anyone who knows about change management knows that old analogy that, you know, organizations are sort of in frozen states and then they begin to re unfreeze, which COVID, of course, has unfrozen everything we know about work and learning. And now it's beginning to refreeze. And, and one of the things I'm saying to the companies that I'm advising 
is that in terms of that refreeze, be sure that the crystals are beginning to be in the position you'd like them to be, or else, you know, work and learning is going to refreeze in a way that you feel pretty unhappy about. So I think having conversations now about the future and, and what the benefits and upsides could be is a very important thing. And technology allows us, you know, for hundreds of thousands of people to join together on a platform to do that. So it's it's an amazing opportunity, I think, to really really begin to fall in love with, with learning technologies. Really is amazing. Yeah, and, and actually there's something there for, for Laura, I think, but from something both Leanne and, and you have said, Linda. Laura, Leanne mentioned that this, this kind of fuzziness, this fog mm -hmm. that we're surrounded by, and then Linda's talked about all of these transitions that typically used, people used to go through before even mm -hmm. getting to the office, and, that, and they've been taken away. How do you, as a practitioner, respond to that in an organizational learning um, uh, point? Yeah, of course. And uh, thank you, Jane, for the warm welcome. Really happy to be here with the other panellists today. So I think when, when I kind of consider that question within the context of, of the LEGO group, it's just we ground ourselves and our starting point, I guess, in everything we do is the belief that children are our role models, and not least because they are the greatest learners of all. So when the global pandemic started to happen, as, a, as an L&D team, we you know, grounded in that belief, the question that we asked ourselves when we took a step back was, how do we maximise organisational impact in adapting and responding to working and leading during this time? And what we've discovered in thinking about that kind of fog and that, that haze, we started to then think about, okay, so on an everyday basis, what are those challenges that people across the organisation globally are facing? And we broke them down into kind of several. One was around how do you better support people to work and lead remotely? You know, how are we going to help support people get set up for success while working at home? You know, notwithstanding the juggle uh, of homeschooling, childcare, on top of being in a global pandemic, but how do you help support people leaders as well who are shifting to remote leadership almost overnight? The second uh, sort of lens that we looked at is about how do people learn, so that learning virtually piece. So. For some, um, you know, face-to-face -face was still a preferred option. But what we've started to see in this, this time is a shift and uplift in the demand from those wanting to attend programs as online courses in a way that we'd never seen before, with better results than we'd even anticipated. And we were trying to manage that balance, to support people manage their well-being, their energy, and their focus, which has been really tough for people. And so the way that we've tried to help people and think about those principles as we've sort of shifted and pivoted the agenda during this time is the considerations that, you know, people value being given a choice. Don't kind of force any of this stuff on people, but actually allow them space and the time if they have the energy for it, if they've got the capacity to lean into it. More than ever, the content needs to be even more relevant, even more meaningful than ever before. And as a team in kind of making these shifts is that appreciation and reminder that getting started is better than being perfect. So just go do, just go and test stuff and just start to make that shift so that we can very quickly were able to kind of adapt how we supported the organisation during this time. Amazing, thank you. There are so many things I would pick up on there as a fellow practitioner. I actually have something for Le for Leanne following on from this, which is around Laura talks about um, how we better support lead uh, support our people in managing and le leading their teams. Um, but then there was also this sort of huge take up of, of virtual learning. Uh, interest that also Linda pointed to uh, with, the, with that wonderful 250,000 people example. On a neuroscience level, Leanne, w w I'm conscious that there's there's a history of oh digital learning doesn't work online learning doesn't work um, from a neuro from a neuroscience perspective. Dr. Leanne Renninger, what is your view on that? <laughs> And I love how this the word doctor, and I'll just I'll like add a little bit of extra to whatever I'm gonna say. I hope <laughs> the pressure's on. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting. I mean, the, everybody on the line here, we're all interested in how do we architect learning better for ourselves and others, right? And so, when you see that as a craft, it becomes a 
really interesting in a way, right? And so what's been really fun for, for myself and my team is we actually started studying the people who are the, the ones who are studying, basically, right? So looking at the, the leaders in the L&D space to see who's being able to do this well quickly. Um, and so I guess what I would add there is just generally, um, if we have the confines of this, this brain, this hood that we have to work with, right? Um, and we actually look to see, well, it's made mostly of motor cortex. And the motor cortex, it wants to move, right? And here we are sitting right now, we're not even moving our heads, we're just looking straight forward. And basically we're data dumping information into the eyes and the ears. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, in everyday work situations, we have the context, even just the switching of the head, where I'm gonna turn my head and look this way, and then look back here, it's like, poof, poof, there's like a cut. And with that cut, the brain has a moment to, to create the synapses, right? And so um, the, I would just add maybe like three takeaways, which hopefully can be something that are that's easy to actually implement. Um, number one is motivation, because folks know they should be learning. It feels good to learn. Dopamine feels really freaking good. It's like the best drug in the world. If we could just have that like distributed everywhere, but um, yeah, but to become a, a dopamine drug dealer, <laughs> <laughs> we have to we have to set things up well. So number one is folks feel like they want to sign up for stuff, like including self-paced learning and whatever. But what's going to be important there is to actually have them finish. One has to really make sure the benefit statements are clear. So my first thing of three, just if I say it quickly, is being really good at naming benefit statements. And my suggestion would be effective frequency. So meaning that we're saying that often throughout the entire whatever training we're doing, whatever advertisement for ourselves and others is like, wait, what's the, what's the takeaway here? What's the benefit? How will it make my life easier? Um, so that's number one. Number two is that I think there's actually a great mistake being made nowadays and still, so it was always being made, now it's still being made, maybe even more than normal, um, in that we have to simplify complexity for people. When that fog is happening, the most important thing is not to add more options for people. Like we're like, oh, here's 3,000 classes you can choose from. But that's, that's just that's some recipe for the brain being like, okay, then none, uh, you know? So um, the thing I would, the takeaway I would have there is, is a very special word called the behavioral unit, the BU. And what, pe what people are focusing on is like the theory and the concepts, but they're not focusing in on the behavioral unit. Um, and if the brain is made of neuro, uh, motor cortex, it, it's basically behavioral. The brain wants to grab onto something small, try it with your hands, with your body, and then master it. And so one of the things that we find really fun is to break down a concept, like for example, oh, we want our people to be better coaches. Like that a lot of orgs come to us and say, train them in coaching. And we say, well, what's, what's the fundamental unit of coaching? And to give an example here, what we've done is we know the fundamental unit of a great coach is their, is their question skills. Do they have questions agility and do they, do they step into a questions mode first rather than a telling mode? So let's train them in what we call key stepping, stepping first into questions mode. As soon as we can get that, that they key step before telling, then everything else that they actually, they might have already known gets unlocked. And so my second point here would be focus on the behavioral unit that's going to unlock the other things that come afterwards, simplify the complexity. Um, and the third thing, and then I'll stop, <laughs> um, is reflection. So what's happening, um, I, I really liked what was, what um, well, in general, um, what was being said earlier about transition points. Um, if we're going from one thing to another to another, and we don't actually physically, we can't embody a change, we cannot getting up and moving, we don't have any reflection points. And so what's going to be really important as practitioners for all of us is to actually institutionalize moments of reflection. So we actually say, pause, let's extract the learning. Even right now, all of you, as you're listening, my suggestion would be you're, in, you're mentally being like, wait, what, what did I just learn? Let me copy down a few words. And the good thing uh, about this is look at like on my space right here, there's post-it notes and I, I can't turn this around, unfortunately I'm wired up too much or I would have. Um, there are post-it notes everywhere. So the moment my day is happening, I'm just writing stuff down everywhere. And in real life, I couldn't have done that in the office. I could have, but I would have looked weird. Not, not like you can't see my hands. Like you don't know what I'm doing right now with my hands. And in fact, I'm writing, 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 right? I've got little notes and whatever. And that helps me to extract learning. So why not use our environment? to work with the brain and just actually produce stuff so that we can extract.
Amazing, thank you. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about benefit statements, but in a slightly different, I love the phrase benefit statement. I'm wondering, Linda, if we got, um, if organizations and societies got these three things in place, so a clear reason as to why people, uh, what people learn and how they learn and how often they learn and what's in it for them. Uh, the second point Leanne talked about uh, around not giving too many options and focusing on the actual behavior uh, and then that, that sort of reflection time, what could, what could be, based on what you know around the future of work and mankind, what could be the benefit to the world or to society or to an organization, a collection of people rather than just one person? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that, that I've, I've been writing about for, for many years, as you know, Dean, is about the future, particularly sort of the trends that are shaping the future. And, and in, in our last book, The New Long Life, we looked particularly at two major trends. One was demographic. Uh, and the other was technological trends. And, and, and if you think sort of demographically, uh, it's likely that many of us, even despite COVID, are going to live much longer than our grandparents and perhaps even into our hundreds. I mean, a hundred year life is, is, is a possibility. And that's really a lifetime of learning. So, you know, learning then has to become, the benefits of learning have to be something that we see uh, all the time. But I think what's really created a massive push is, is the impact of technology. Because, you know, all of us are now living and working in a world where the stuff that we did isn't uh, necessarily going to be, now is, isn't necessarily going to be the stuff that we do in the future. One of my sons is, is here right now. I'm, I'm at my house in France. And, you know, he's, he's learning to be a surgeon. And, you know, what, what that was, was nothing like what it is now in terms of, you know, using robotics and so on. And so, you know, we have to really change the skills that we have and we have to, I, I mean, I think the good news for humankind, as it were, is that we need to, that the things that machines can't do uh, are, are things that humans are really good at, which is listening, uh, you know, cognitive processing, being creative, uh, being empathic. But those take learning and skills to be able to do that. So I think that, I mean, my view is that upskilling and reskilling is really the most important agenda right now. That's one of the reasons that I've been sitting on the World Economic Forum Council for that, on that for many, for many years. And one of the things that we've said at the WEF is that we want to support, you know, a billion people to upskill and to reskill. Now, our worry is obviously that during COVID, people are going to be really, it's just not on the agenda anymore. And, and we've got quite clear data on that. We've been, we, we've been surveying people and asking, you know, do you think you're spending time upskilling and reskilling? People are certainly learning a lot through experimentation, but the actual time they're spending in, you know, rather more formal learning processes has gone right down. So I think that, you know, we've got to really put the whole learning agenda back in to, to be the center of the work. In the way that Lego is doing, you know, I, I love Laura's comment. I, I have some grandchildren here at the moment and a two-year-old who, honestly, I could just watch constantly the way that he's constantly learning and, and I, I agree with, with Laura that, that if you see the way that children learn it's a constant experience and and we need to get back to that and, and I know that we're all hoping that the new world will be different than the old world and maybe part of the new world will be that we really focus on learning as adults and learning as adults in the way that children learn. Yes, and interesting that you say that it's been taken off the table. I think that there's conflicting research at the moment around, um, as a result of COVID, which organizations have increased their investment in learning or reduced it or removed it altogether. And if I think back to, and, and Laura will, will know this as well, if I think back to the sort of global financial crisis when I was in the earlier stage of my HR career, learning was the first thing to go. We're not actually seeing that this time around. I think organizations have really learned that um, learning, growth, development, continuous professional development is really, really important where they still can have the money. I don't think it's at the center of business's strategy in the way that I think you're suggesting it, it probably should be, um, but uh, it, it's certainly higher up on the agenda than it was even sort of 10, 12 years ago. So that's a really interesting shift and one that I know you, you predicted yourself in, in some of your earlier works. Laura, I'm just thinking about uh, everything that Leanne and, and uh, Linda have, have put forward. How do you bring all of this into the, 
into the organizational learning space. So you talked to yourself earlier about choice. You've talked about, I think I think it was Linda actually that referred last week to tinkering or exploration. Yeah. How do you bring all of this to bear uh, to, in the interest of improving the skills, upskilling and reskilling your people? Where are you on that journey? Yeah, sure. So I think we've been on quite a journey over the last couple of years as we start to evolve organisational learning. So what we've seen during this time is an acceleration of the, our ability to be able to do that, the impact that it's having, the scale at which we've been able to and the, the amount of people that we have been able to reach. So actually for us in, in the LEGO group, we're seeing more people kind of leaning in and engaged with more kind of everyday learning moments. So, you know, there is no doubt that kind of that time taken for formal learning perhaps has started to go down a little bit. But actually that kind of informal learning, that getting people into that mindset of um, kind of where are those everyday learning moments. And one of the ways we've been able to do that is Last year we launched our leadership playground, which is our leadership model. So it's grounded in this belief that leadership is an act, not a position. And one of the things that we um, have as part of that leadership playground and a key strength of it is a playground builder community. So we've got more than a thousand playground builders across the organization. And what that means is that every team has a playground builder. We're not having a kind of a top-down rollout of this, but it's more how do we spark that uh, movement in the organization? And the playground builders play a really critical role in helping kind of create that momentum throughout the organization. One of the things in order to bring that leadership playground to life is something which we call missions, which in effect is experimentation. So how do we kind of, you know, start to bring those behaviours of being more brave, more curious and more focused to life every day? We do that through the use of missions by kind of okay. testing, learning, adapting. Yeah. And that's something that we've seen has been really successful to kind of start to bring that to life every day. That's great, thank you. So, sorry to ask, but a couple of people in the attendee list haven't muted. If I could ask you to mute, that would be really helpful because there's just a, a touch of background noise. Thank you. Laura, I loved what you said about informal learning and um, what are they called playground builders. Yes, yeah. What, how brand consistent is that? Amazing. <laughs> um, uh, there's, a, there's something that Linda has said on a number of her webinars that I have um, uh, shamelessly stalked her on um, uh, about th the impact on sort of uh, what governments might do to help organizations uh, and also the interplay between governments and the private sector in this upskill reskill thing. Linda, I'm just wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about how informal learning might play a, a role in that rather than maybe something a bit more formalized that, that many governments have adopted of, of recent years. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that I write with an economist, I'm a psychologist, but, you know, that's been incredibly interesting, actually. The last two books were written with Andrew Scott, who's an econ economist at London Business School. And so inevitably, you know, economics tends to think about at the level of government. You know, we as psychologists tend to think either at the level of the individual or the level of the organization. So in our new book, The New Long Life, we talk quite a lot about what should governments do. And, and part of what we say, we say we, we think should happen is that there should be a much clearer focus on learning. And of course, that's got something to do with the education system that I'm part of, which really has to change. Uh, but also, uh, it, you know, with governments. And one of the things that we're saying is that particularly, you know, for people to really want to learn, and I totally get Leanne's point, and I think it's such an important one of the benefits, is that they need to understand why am I learning this? And, and that means that we have to find a way of sort of credentializing learning. And a part of the reason, by the way, that, that universities like ours do so well is that we're a mechanism of, of credentializing. You know, you leave with an MBA. Now, it may be, you know, there was a wonderful study watch which asked people from Harvard, graduated from Harvard Business School, would you have rather gone to, a, to Harvard or would you rather have the certificate to say you've gone to Harvard? Most of them chose the certificate because that was a credentializing. And I think one of the things that both governments and education has to do 
is to help people to credentialize their learning so that they know, you know, I have actually learned this and it has a benefit to me and also to the work I want to do. And the second thing that, that, that governments have to do is to help people understand what is it that I should be learning right now? Because, because the world of work is changing so quickly, if you simply learn what you think are the most important skills now, it's very possible that by the time you've learned those skills, a whole new set of skills have arisen. So, you know, if you ask, well, which governments are great at that, it's going to be, I'm afraid, the usual group. You know, Singapore is amazing. They give every citizen an amount of money to spend every year on learning. Uh, Denmark's done some great work and, like, you know, Laura, you know that very well, but, but Denmark's been incredibly, um, and of course, Lego has played a really important role in helping, you know, the government think about that. Um, and, 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 you know, the UK and the US, are, are, you know, I just haven't been able to do that. As you know really well, uh, Laura, at the end, is that in, in the States, people spend a huge amount of their own personal money on learning. And in some cases have, have attended courses which have been absolutely useless. So, you know, we, we have to also look at the infrastructure. I mean, what I love about this panel and why I was so excited about doing it today is that we've got, you know, the three levels, you know, Leanne is looking at the brain and that's so important. Laura, you're looking at what a company like Lego can do, which is so fundamentally built on learning. And my interest is up the level of the organization, but also the context of, of what governments can do. And, you know, we have to encourage all of that to happen simultaneously. Um, and, and, and that's really, you know, that's what we're all facing right now. As we start to refreeze, is there a way that we could refreeze in a way that really makes learning, you know, the, the center of what we do? Mm -hmm. And, and interesting, would it be refreezing though, or is the? Uh, I understand the use of the analogy because it's the uh, it's the old unfreeze, yeah. freeze, refreeze, yeah. uh, change, change model. But I, I'm wondering, is is even freezing it still too inflexible for where we're going and and how responsive we need to be? Yeah, I, I mean, I I think you know the truth is that that we will have a refreeze because you know organisations. But it is exactly the point actually <laughs> Leanne made when she said earlier that, you know, people need, we need to reduce complexity. And, and one of the reasons why organizations sort of refreeze their practices and processes is it reduces complexity and increases people's understanding of what's going on. So, you know, as um, I've looked at the cases of organizations, as you know, Dean, for more than 30 years, and the ones uh, that constantly change and never freeze are very, can often be very difficult places for their for their employees. So the challenge that we face is how do we form an organization that's, that's agile, but at the same time has a structure in it that makes it obvious to people what it is they're required to do, both in terms of values and behaviors. And I think actually I mean, it's great to have Laura on the, on, on, the, on the panel, because I think Lego has been absolutely brilliant at that, at actually saying, you know, we are agile, but at the same time, there are fundamental aspects of being in Lego that make make what Lego is. And so it's that combination, isn't it, that's going to be so interesting. Absolutely. Leanne, what's, what is your view of what Linda's just said? She kind of put that to you. I'd, I'd, be, I'd love you to respond. Yeah, it's so hard. I'm like sitting here, I'm like, oh, oh wait, this is <laughs> <laughs> to say. Um, well, you know, we're talking mean, like some metaphors here around like freeze and unfreeze. I wonder if a good like visual for this is like slush, you know, like, <laughs> and basically I, I want like the people we're training, I want them to stay slushy. So sure, freeze a little bit, but then like be able to move around, right? So how do you, what's, what's the behavioral unit of slushiness, right? Yeah. Question I always want to be asking: What's the behavioral unit of slushiness? And then, in general, um, uh, like if I if I then break that down, right? And and what's the benefit of staying slushy? So those are two questions always: What's the behavioral unit? What's the benefit? Because the brain's going to work best when I know those two. That's what the architecture wants in there, right? Um, and so the behavioral unit of slushiness, basically, uh, if I use a different word for it, we we're going to have to train for adaptivity. Uh, society, yeah. like this is this is Corona is one example of we don't know. Like all of us, wherever we are in the world right now, we don't know what's going to happen in three months from now, right? So the best thing we can do is to train for adaptivity and resilience. Now there's a whole set of skills under adaptivity and resilience that are actually quite surprising. So you, one might think it's like, oh yeah, you know, it's mindset, 
its um, its its ability to you know diagram out the options and scenario plan. Sure, yeah, that's that's true. But there's actually a lot of stuff under there, and that's where like the one of the things we find really fun is like what is the true behavioral unit in there? Um, and and the the things I would say there is on a let's go to site the org level, then we go to the team level, and the individual level. I'll work backwards here on the org level. The concept of we want to be able to outlearn the competition. I find fun because we 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 subvert competition in that way. Then right, so I don't care about I hate competition, right? But I do like competition when I'm trying to outlearn the other. It's for a grand mission, right? So, uh, and then the other thing on the org level, the words that I like uh, sharing at the where we work with people is we want to actually hire not know it alls but learn it alls. We don't want know it alls. We want learn it alls. And so what I want to do is I want to create the conditions, the ecosystem. To, to like basically grow these learner dolls um, on the team level that's going to be being able to extract together and be able to um, to, to catalyze insight in one another through the better question set, so the key stepping skills. As soon as you train people to ask better questions, you get better thinking, simply, right? But everybody has a fingerprint, like the set of questions they ask is like a very similar set over and over again. Uh, even all of us here on this line, if you actually ask yourself, What's the most common question I ask? I bet you it's very similar over and over. You might always ask, like, what's the obstacle? If you're an obstacle-based thinker, or someone else might say, well, what's the alternative? If you're a brainstormer, and that's annoying to the rest of the team because you're like, ah, <laughs> what are the other options? Right? Whatever that is, but we need to have some agility to be able to move to pivot when this question we're asking is not actually working. Um, and so this would be the last thing I would say um, is that if we practice flexibility now, when things are calm, okay, they're not really calm, but they're calmer than it has been in the past. If we practice flexibility, we're going to have to do that in groups because we need people to throw things at us. So setting up practice labs, uh, it sounds a lot like what this, this leadership playground, so we, on our side of it, we call them labs, right? So practice labs. And in doing so, I'll, I'll do one more little tie back to what I was saying earlier, the brain's made of neurocortex, uh, uh, sorry, motor cortex. And that's going to be that we have to still embody our learning. Uh, and I'll give you one small example, all of you as listeners. If you, let's say you wanted to take, um, I was teaching a, a course uh, yesterday, and we were talking about like, how do you get to the space of being able to share with people uh, really good feedback? And a lot of people know how to do it. We taught them. They have a really good formula for giving any difficult message well. But there was something happening before that that wasn't enabling them to be able to get into the space of that formula being activated. The algorithm couldn't kick in because they weren't in the right headspace because they were getting offended. And when you're offended, all this, the wiring that's in there, we can't access it, right? And so um, just spontaneously, I was like, oh, we have to get through this offended thing. So I had them actually draw on a piece of paper, and some of you can do this now if you have paper sitting near you, and I hope you do. That's the best way to learn, have that paper sitting near you. Draw a box on one side and write the word offended in that box. Okay, and then what I'd like for you all to do right now is draw another box on the right side and that says not offended. And draw a box around that. And if you really do this, the benefit of it will be you're going to you're going to encode this a lot better, right? So you have the offended and the non-offended boxes. Okay, now what I can do is I can throw a bunch of scenarios at you and I could say, now touch your hand into the land of offended, the country of offended. What would the citizens of that land do in the country of offended with this statement? So let's just say I say, oh, sorry, I forgot to invite you to that very important meeting that I know you really wanted to go to. I just forgot to invite you, right? And now touch your hand into the offended land. And what's, what would be happening under your hood when you're offended? You'd be like, oh, my gosh, I'm not valued at all here, or um, they're purposefully excluding me or whatever. And then I say, now pick your hand up. Put your hand down in non-offended land. What would you need to say under your hood? to not be offended. And there I might say like, oh, we'll have to really help clean this process up here. Or like, oh, I'm really curious to understand what's going on with them because obviously they're missing out on something or whatever, right? Uh, but the, the actual kinesthetic touching of stuff, which I think also happens very often in the, in the Lego groups uh, exercises, and the same with the Life Labs learning exercises, is where we get to the space of the old archaic architecture meeting the digital space and the new society we live in. Wow. Any any thoughts, ladies? Yeah, I think listening, it's that hands-on kind of minds-on approach. So I, I love what you were saying, Leanne, about kind of training for um, adapt, you know, adaptability. And I think, I think for many people, what we're we're noticing 
is that people have kind of rationally understood VUCA. For some people, they would have also been able to, you know, shared some experience of being in a VUCA world. But I think what COVID has done has kind of really, kind of that has been an embodiment for everyone to kind of step into that VUCA world and has kind of forced people to have to think about adapting beyond it kind of being a kind of intellectual response, actually, yeah, I do need to do something differently because uh, that's the way that I should be doing it. it it's kind of forced people into to really thinking about it. So feeling hopeful that in that current context, we can then start to kind of ensure that some of those new habits that are you know, being made, some of those new routines, those new rituals, we can start at an organizational level to kind of bring forward um, as well as we come out the other side. Um, of COVID-19. Brilliant, thank you. I love this term slushy, Leanne, I love it. What, you talked about what are the behavioural units of slushy, have you got any in mind? Mm, yes, oh gosh, I have so many in mind, um, but we want to simplify complexity. Uh, so I have to find the ones that matter most, and so it's another just concept I want to throw out there, tipping point skills. So what is the one skill that when I get that one, it's going to unlock all the others? Uh, those are the ones I want to zero in on. And, and that's part of what the research my team is doing, which is always trying to isolate what's the tipping point. Um, and so around adaptivity, that, that's a work in progress. Um, but a few that I can actually name are being able to demarcate learning. What I mean by demarcate is you picture a river flowing by of information and experience. It's happening every single day. Um, but yet there's like these little bits that like flip by and we could actually name them. If we wanted to, we could reach out and grab them, right? And so that would be a demarcation. And so as the day goes by, being able to be like, wait, what's that? Let me put a label to that thing that's going on right here, right now. Um, that's going to be an important piece. So demarcation skills is something we're training people in. And that's really good for managers. Um, so we do manager training where they have to be able to notice something a direct report is doing, but put a good label to it. So if I have a direct report who's, who's having some trouble with their succinctness skills, they're talking too long, right? I need to be able to notice moments where they were succinct and, and call them out, right? And that's, of course, accentuating the positive, but putting the label on it with the direct report, what that happens, what lets us do is be able to have something to grab onto and spin around and talk about going forward. The demarcation skills will be important for adaptivity because I can transfer the skill from some other moment in time in the past. Like when in the past were we able to, as a team, be very succinct around our ideas? Okay, it was then. All right, now, how is this current situation, even though it's new to us, in some ways similar to that old situation? And so with that, we start getting transfer skills, which is a, a neuroscientific concept that's really clear. The brain needs to be able to make those transfers. So I'll just name one of the tipping points here, which is surprising, is your ability to demarcate, which means to label, like to codify basically what one is seeing and synthesize it down into a single word that could be referred to going forward. That would be one of them. It sounds to me a little bit like, and, and the way I'm going to demarcate that that, that learning from, from myself is it, it's almost like the learning equivalent of emotional agility that um, uh, Susan, Dr. Susan, Susan David talks about. Uh, I'm wondering, Linda, if, if, if everybody, it, we, we've talked at the brain level and Leanne's given us some amazing um, tips there on, on how we might do this a bit better. If societally we did this better or as a collective, what do you think would be the impact on our psychological well-being, both in the workplace and also in, in, the, in our broader lives? Well, you know, I'm you know, I'm going to be like a politician, Dean, and answer answer a slightly different question. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I, I just tell you what's sort of been fascinating me about our conversation. Um, you, you know, it, 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 the thing that's happening at the moment about about work and about learning is everybody's talking about it, aren't they? You know, I. We, we got our family together l last night, and Leanne, we're a little bit like you. We we sit and talk every evening, and 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 they come from all sorts of walks of life, and their kids are here, and parent and, and ch children, and so, and and that's all that anyone talks about. So all that everybody talks about is how are we going to work, and and what I think is so important about that is that, as Laura says, we're actually living viscerally a VUCA world. I mean, it's unbelievable what we're all living through. It is. I was just talking to my husband this morning. I mean, 
I'm 65. I lived through, you know, I was d during the last um, economic crisis. I was the Lehman professor at London Business School. I had a named chair, which, which disappeared obviously overnight. So as Lehman Brothers disappeared, I also, in terms of, I, I still remained a professor, but I didn't have this marvelous amount of money that was supporting my research. It just literally disappeared. And uh, but but that just really happened to me and, and the other people who are involved in in that. But but actually here everybody's uh, everybody's impacted. And, and in our new book we talk about the philosopher John Rawl R A W -L, L, and and he says you know he says that most of us don't really understand others. We see others through a curtain. You know we don't really understand the lives of others. Well hey we certainly understand the lives of others now, and that means that we're talking about it at a level of detail, which I think is really important, because I, I agree with Laura that the details for me are about habits and rituals, that, or they're what, what Leanne would call the behavioral units. I mean, it is all about the detail, and I think that you know, as we construct what is it we want to be next and do next, it will be about everyday habits. And, and if you think about habits, um, you know, let's say you want to lose lots of weight, and they show you 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 go and, and look at an ad which shows you know the fat person, the thin person. I don't know if you notice it's always twelve weeks, because twelve weeks is really the point at which the habits begin to form, and new habits begin to form, new eating habits, new exercise habits. Well, we're way past twelve weeks now. We're on what what is it? Do I say we're one day one hundred and thirty seven? So that's a lot more than twelve weeks. And so actually we have the possibility, probably the only time in our whole life, to reinvent what we do and to reinvent our habits and reinvent our rituals. But I agree with Leanne that that will be done at the level of what she calls the behavioral unit, that it will be very small things that completely change how we work and, and how we think about others. So, you know, of course we have to carry on learning. And, and if everybody became learners, the world would be a better place. I mean, it would be, that's a sort of, that's an, a, a, that's an obvious point really to make. Um, but I think that we have all learned, uh, and that's been the, the process of tinkering and experimentation we've got. At London Business School, you know, we've been trying for years and years and years to build more virtual training. Uh, we're all doing it. I mean, right this moment during this week, I'm building a whole virtual program on the future of work, which, which is our, you know, I run at London Business School. I have an elective, which is one of our most popular electives. It's now going to be available as a virtual program, and it took COVID to do that. <laughs> What an achievement, and uh, we have similar as Avada. I'm not here to plug Avada at all, but we, we, we like many organisations, had to pivot so quickly in order to take what was traditionally a face-to-face -face, um, learning opportunity, and in some cases over some months, into short, uh, small, bite-sized, online delivered programs, still human interactive, but delivered through the medium of the computer rather than in a classroom as it traditionally was. And that leads quite nicely, Linda, actually onto a question I've had for, for all three of you from Vicky in, in the audience who says, uh, going back to the original question on modes of learning, thanks for calling out the moderator there, do you <laughs> think there is still a place for face-to-face -face learning in the future? I hear from our learners, I'm not, not sure where, where she is, that they appreciate the virtual learning considering current restrictions, but they would be keen to return to face-to-face -face as soon as they can. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Well, shall I jump in first on that? I mean, I. Yeah. I, I I totally, so one of the questions that I'm really talking to the companies that we advise about is, is, is what will we do about space, you know, because space really is where quite a lot of learning takes place. And I, I did a, a really nice webinar with, uh, with, with Jenny Emery, who's one of the senior people from Arup, which Arup is the, the company, the engineering design company that designs all sorts of amazing things that you know. And actually, it's a London Business School webinar. It's really worth, if you have an hour, it's really worth listening to because, you know, she was absolutely brilliant about how they're reconsidering space. And to your question, sorry, I don't know your, the name of your question, but to, to, to their question, um, there's a really big point that, that, that space offices are where you learn, where we learn. So, you know, up until now, offices were the place that we did tasks. You know, we, we went and sort of closed the door and did task stuff that we could do autonomously. But Arab's perspective, and increasingly mine, is that 
you know, because face to face will be such a valuable asset for us, we have to be really thoughtful about how we use it. And I think face to face offices. So what Arup are doing is they're beginning to reimagine the office as a community of learning. Now that they've always sort of done that in terms of the way they have open spaces and the way they encourage people to move around and so on. But actually, if you said we are designing this space only to learn, I mean, a little bit, Laura, like you do when mm. you're designing a Lego. Uh, mm you know, a space, then it would look really different. And I, I suspect that that's going to be the next generation of face-to-face of -face offices is they will be places of learning. I, I agree. I think, and a lot of the research is certainly starting to hint at that direction. Yeah. I, I think that there is a question that comes to mind because we've done a lot of research in in this space and, and it's been proven through our programs. It's actually not so much about the physical uh, environment or the physical interaction, but it is very much about the social aspect. Mm -hmm. So, what, what what we call connected learning. Do you do you think the physical um, side is important, or is it more around the connection and that sort of well, sociability? Yeah, I think it's both. Actually, in fact, I, I know that I'm sure that Leah and Laura will have a fantastic response to this, but. Um, you know, we asked people from the very beginning, how do you, what do you miss about working, you know, what, what, how is virtual working working for you, working from home? Most people said, actually, the technology is amazing, which is pretty incredible, isn't it? Five years ago, the technology would not have been amazing. But actually, the thing that people said is we really miss social interaction. And, and that's gone up. So each time that we, you know, every week when we, we survey, that, that's, just, that's just increased. And, and even there's been very few proper experiments of people working from home. The only one actually was by a Stanford professor where he looked at Chinese call center workers and, and actually found that quite a lot of them didn't want to work from home all the time because they just got so lonely. I mean, humans want social interaction. So, you know, this idea of blended and hybrid and all the things that LBS is trying to do and you're trying to do and we're all trying to do, I think that's where we're going to end up. So what we're doing at London Business School is we're asking ourselves, we can get some of our students into the class some of the time. So what, what, what will that be about? Um, and I think post at the moment, it's not about very much, I'm afraid, but co post COVID, I think it will be about face to face and just chatting to people. And, you know, I think Leanne or maybe Laura earlier said, you know, one of the things that we're knowing, noticing about networks is that, um, you know, our networks have shrunk. We're spending more time interacting on Zoom with people we already know and the sort of serendipitous, um, uh, you know, just bumping into people, which is so important for creativity. But that's really broken down. And, and that's something I have a column at MIT Sloan, which I've done every two weeks. And I had a whole column devoted to that a few, a few weeks ago. And I, that's a real worry for me. And I think how do we build serendipitous learning is going to be the, the, mm. one of the big questions. And Linda, just to, to build on that as well, I think that serendipitous learning, what we're noticing is that it requires much more effort for when it happened. And as time has gone on, we've started to see kind of people becoming more creative um, with how they're doing that. So kind of keeping meetings running so that you've kind of always got the chat going, that you can kind of drop in virtually, having virtual copies, that kind of thing is something that we're kind of really, really seeing. And I think for us, and I think about organisational learning, it's you know, we've got our office workers, we've got our production sites with our factories, and we've also got all of our retail stores. So, of course, it's never going to be, um, an, you know, one thing or the other. It's always going to need to be relevant and pertinent for each of those different parts of the organisation. But, but certainly, if I think about kind of our office-based employees, very much the, the program side of things, next year we will continue to deliver live online uh, facilitated programmes with face-to-face -face being uh, by exception. We'll mm -hmm. see how that plays out, but you know that's certainly one of the design principles that we'll be kind of heading into to next year. But alongside that, thinking about actually how do you help support people to be more deliberate in those serendipitous moments, to yeah. be more deliberate in how they continue to build networks and that yeah. kind of thing. So it has to run kind of parallel with that. And I think, you know, what's really exciting about this moment, I mean, I'm a, I study networks, it's one of the areas that I work on, and we have at London Business School some of the world's greatest network theorists, and they don't have the answer to that. So, you know, what's so exciting at the moment is it's not that, you know, oh gosh, there, here's a textbook that says, how do you do serendipitous? <laughs> nobody, nobody has a 
a clue how to do it. And and I think what's amazing about what you're saying, Laura, and, and Leanne as well, is that we're all in this huge petri dish of exploration, aren't we? Part of the reason I kept the diary and part of the reason I've written so much, I've written endlessly at the moment. I'm not a book, actually. I've just written columns because, you know, the reason I'm writing a column for MIT, I finished one yesterday. You'll see it in three days' time. I mean, that's the sort of speed, isn't it, that people want to interact at the moment. Uh, they don't want to wait for uh, this, this marvellous book of mine came out last couple of weeks ago, but it was actually finished more than a year ago. It doesn't have anything about pandemic or COVID in it, obviously. And so we've really got to, a, we've gone to a very, very fast cycle. You know, you were talking earlier about, you know, just the way that you're managing that cycle in terms of, you know, learn, relearn. I mean, that cycle is now, gosh, I've learned so much every day. And like everybody else, I write everything down. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Leanne, I'd love to hear your response to the original question around face-to-face -face learning. Yeah, well, I mean, in the end here, we have our faces facing each other, right? So <laughs> we are face-to-face, -face, it's just our bodies aren't body-to-body -body, uh, <laughs> that way. So we're just disembodied learning. And so that's the interesting piece from from my side. So um, I guess there'd be two things I would add to that. Like generally, one can, the brain is so malleable, we can recreate contextually a feeling of the office. So I could say, imagine your direct report sitting in front of you right now, and your direct report says X, Y, Z, and I get them into like a feeling of it, and I can even have them draw, uh, like with their hands, draw what the space might be like, and this is happening, and with that I create, I embed cues for if then trigger. So if this is happening, then I do this. So I can actually, I can modulate that, but what I do need is FaceTime with them. Um, so self-led learning I think is really, really important. Um, the hard part is then we have to let them practice their adaptivity skills, which they need another human for. And so I guess what I would I would wrap us here with a, a kind of a recircling back to when we have them, let's say there's a practice lab happening, we have them actually, they've done their self-led, now they're doing a practice lab. What happens is they have to be good in the serendipitous moments to do better questions to each other, so key stepping skills. They have to be good at demarcating. They have to be able to extract out, what did I just learn from that serendipitous meeting? You know, maybe when the meeting was just left, the, the Zoom was left open to do that. Okay, what did I learn though? They extract that. And then in general, how am I going to apply it going forward? What I just learned, so the transfer skills, those three behavioral units. Mm. Incredible, thank you. I'm really conscious that that is, uh, that is, I'm afraid, as much as we've got time for, though I do know that all four of us could talk about this all afternoon <laughs> and all morning in your case, Leanne. So uh, I just want to say thank you so much, all three of you, for joining me. It's been a, a, a very honourable pleasure on my part. As you all know, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, as I said to everybody uh, attending before, uh, Leanne and Life Labs Learning are doing some super cool stuff, uh, particularly in the leadership development space. Um, if you don't know them, I really recommend you should. Uh, if you want to get in touch, uh, her details are here. Laura, uh, thank you. Amazing, amazing perspective on what a very cool, very recognisable, very global, very socially impactful brand is doing in the world of learning. Thank you for your perspective. You. And uh, Linda, the Prof Gretton, thank you very much for your macro big picture here on Future of Work. Uh, as I said to everybody, Linda's latest book is uh, the, the New Long Life. Um, I would definitely recommend a read of that and also The Hundred Year Life as well. They're both uh, extremely insightful for HR leaders. Uh, so thank you very much. If you want to get in touch with Abado about any of this or you want to get in touch with us about the approach that we take to learning, uh, which takes into account a lot of what these three wonderful ladies have talked about today, uh, you can get in touch with Jason in the UK and Amir uh, or Sonia over in our Asia Pacific business. Uh, and I'll leave, I'll leave on that note. Thank you so much again. It's been a pleasure. Uh, to do this fifth and final episode of this series. Thank you. Thank you.